Okay, everybody, we're going to get started. We want to begin by acknowledging our presence on the ancestral and unceded territory of the Tongva and Keech Nation peoples and their neighbors from north to south, the Chumash, the Tataviam, Katanamuk, Serrano, Kuia, Peon Kuichim, Ahashaman, Ipai Tipai, the Kumyai, and the Kechan peoples, whose ancestors ruled the region that we now call Southern California for at least 9,000 years. Indigenous stewardship and rightful claims to these lands have never been voluntarily relinquished nor legally extinguished. We pay respects to the members and elders of these communities, past and present, who remain caretakers and advocates of these lands, river systems, and the waters and islands of the Santa Barbara Channel. For a more detailed land acknowledgement offered by the USC Van Hunnick History Department, we invite you to visit their website. And for those of you on Zoom, my colleague Maya will put a link to that in the chat. Um, so my name is Martha Stroud. I'm the Associate Director of the USC Dorn Site Center for Advanced Genocide Research. And on behalf of the Center and the USC Max Cotta Institute for Austrian German Swiss Studies, who are presenting this event jointly, I'm delighted to welcome all of you in person and those of you joining us online. I'm just going to offer a couple of notes about the Zoom protocols for those watching. Right now, you're viewing a side-by-side -side of the speaker and the slides that we're sharing. And you can make either side bigger or smaller by dragging the dividing line between the two windows. So we'll have time for questions and discussion following the lecture. And we invite all of your participation here and your participation online. For those of you on Zoom, please use the Q&A feature at the bottom of the Zoom window, and we'll try to get to as many questions as time permits. We are recording the lecture, and thanks to Professor Port, we will be making the video available widely afterwards. Um, and we will be sharing the chat and the Q&A with Professor Port as well. So if you have any questions, uh, feedback or questions that we don't get to, he will see them afterwards. So now to introduce today's lecture and our speaker, it's my pleasure to introduce the director of the USC Max Cotta Institute for Austrian German Swiss Studies and professor of history at USC, Paul Lerner. Thank you so much, Martha. It's really always a pleasure to collaborate with the center. Um, so I'm really grateful that we've been able to come together again um, for this special event. Um, so uh, it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker today, Professor Andrew Port. Um, Andrew Port is professor of history at Wayne State University in Detroit, where he's taught since 2003. He earned his PhD at Harvard and his BA in history at Yale. Andrew's early work made significant contributions to the scholarship on the history of the GDR, above all through his 2007 book, Conflict and Stability in the German Democratic Republic, which was published by Cambridge University Press and published in German translation in 2010 as Die Rätselhafte Stabilität der DDR, the um, sort of peculiar or um, um, Mysterious is better, thank you. The mysterious stability of the of German Democratic Republic. Um, he's known to a great many of us in German and European history from his years as editor-in-chief of the Central European History, the field's flagship journal, from 2014 through 2019. <laughs> Professor Port's work has received a great many prizes and awards, too many to mention here, but worth noting is his receipt of the DAAD Prize for Distinguished Scholarship in German and European Studies through Johns Hopkins' American Center for Contemporary German Studies. Andrew Port also edited Becoming East Germans, Socialist Structures and Sensibilities After Hitler with Mary Fulbrook, which appeared with Berghahn in 2013. 
and he's now working on a new history of Germany after 1945 for Polity Press. In addition to being a prolific scholar who has served the profession generously, he's had a significant public-facing presence, providing a historical perspective on current events in numerous articles and editorials. Professor Port's new book, the subject of his discussion today, asks how memories of the Nazi past became entangled in post-war German identities and shaped German responses to genocides and outbreaks of mass violence around the world, with particular attention to Cambodia, Bosnia, and Rwanda. Never again, Germans in Genocide After the Holocaust, which was published last year by Harvard Press, has already received a great deal of attention, and the questions it raises are perhaps more relevant and urgent than ever. Please join me in welcoming Professor Andrew Port. Thank you, Paul. I, I really think that might be the nicest introduction I have ever gotten. If you're available for my funeral, I okay. know that. Would, I mean, I don't mean. You know. I think I'm a little older, so. Yeah. <laughs> Martha, thank you for arranging this, and Bart, thank you as well for being involved. Um, and, and I should thank somebody for the nice weather. I'm the only person who leaves Detroit to come to California when it's warmer in Detroit than it is <laughs> here. Let me start by setting the scene. Sarajevo, several months after the signing of the Dayton Peace Accords that ended the war in Bosnia, Departing Serb forces in a final act of vengeful spite are setting aflame any structures still standing after their four year long siege of the Bosnian capital. Dr. Rupert Neudek spends the day with his son Marcel in a residential section of the city, breaking down doors and rushing into burning buildings to save the lives of ordered, uh, elderly Muslims. The winter of 1996 is a cold one, and Dr. Neudek is taking yet another holiday with his immediate family in an active war zone. It's his third time there since news first broke about genocidal ethnic cleansing, mass rape, and the setting up of quote-unquote concentration camps in the Balkans. That evening, the renowned German journalist and humanitarian sits quietly in a Bosnian friend's apartment reading, out of necessity, by candlelight, a book about the Wehrmacht's occupation of Poland a half century earlier. Waking to the sound of explosions early the next day, he looks out the window at all the destruction in the street below. Quote, that was precisely how I imagined early mornings in the Warsaw ghetto. There are olfactory reminders of the past as well. The road that, quote, smelled of genocide near Srebrenica, for instance, or the, quote, treacly foul stench of decaying corpses in Kigali. Yes, Rupert Neudek had also been in Rwanda during the genocidal rampage of 1994, and that was no coincidence. Over the previous decade and a half, he had frequently been among the first German volunteers to arrive in trouble spots across the globe, organizing dozens of humanitarian missions from Southeast Asia to Southeast Europe. Most of this work was done on the side as a shoestring operation of sorts during vacation or on nights and weekends with his wife, uh, Christa, you see here. They did this in their modest uh, townhouse on the outskirts of Cologne. That was where I visited Rupert Neudek to find out why he had chosen to go to places like Mogadishu instead of Mallorca, a preferred vacation spot for most middle-class Germans. Neudek, you get a better sense of it here, Neudek cut a dashing figure with, with a gaunt, weathered face and neatly trimmed white beard. He had the air of a sea captain, though he was often mistaken for a medical doctor, an understandable error given all the medical assistance he had brought to Asia and Africa over the years. He was, in fact, a doctor of philosophy. Born in Danzig on the eve of World War II, 
Nidek fled westward with his mother and young siblings away from the Red Army in the waning months of the war. He studied law as a young man and served as a Jesuit novice. But he then decided to change course and write a doctoral thesis on the political ethics of the French existential philosophers Sartre and Camus. After completing his degree, Moidek took a different career path once again, beginning work in 1977 as a journalist and editor at West Germany's uh, premier public radio station, essentially the German, West German equivalent of NPR. He and his wife, he later told me, were leading a, quote, perfectly bourgeois life at the time. Well, that all changed in February 1979 during a trip he took to Paris to collect material for a new book on Sartre. It was there that Neudeck met with the renowned French philosopher André Glucksmann, who you see here. Uh, Glucksmann was the first to speak with him at length about the dire situation of the so-called boat people in Southeast Asia. Their plight had just broken as a major news story several months earlier. Que faites-vous? Luxman greeted Neudeck in the cafe where they met. What was he personally going to do about the refugees? Neudeck had similarly memorable meetings with Sartre himself and also with Bernard Kushner, whom you see here on the left. Kushner, of course, the future French foreign minister who had founded Doctors Without Borders in 1971. Uh, here you see Glucks, I don't know if this is the cafe they met in, but there's Glucksmann in a cafe in Paris. This is Kushner aboard a ship called Un Bateau pour le Vietnam, a ship for Vietnam, which he chartered uh, and, and went to the South China Sea to, to uh, rescue uh, boat people. Inspired by the three men, Neudeck returned to Germany, intent on doing his part to help refugees from the region who were stranded and dying on the high seas. That decision had a great deal to do with Neudeck's own personal history. On January 30th, 1945, during their flight from Danzig, he and his family arrived in the Baltic port city of Gotenhafen, where they saw a large cruise ship in the harbor, the Wilhelm Gusloff, which you see here on the left. Uh, originally built in the mid-1930s for the Nazi leisure movement Kraft durch Freude, or Strength Through Joy, the ship was now being used to evacuate German officials, civilians, and refugees from the advancing Soviet army. Neudeck's mother did not have tickets for the Guslav. She wouldn't have taken a, quote, luxury ship for Nazi bigwigs anyway, he later insisted. And they wound up on board a coal steamer instead. That was our savior, he told me. Later that day, a Soviet submarine sank the Guslov, and thousands of its passengers drowned in the freezing waters of the Baltic. The news quickly reached him and his family, and horrific images of the disaster left an indelible impression on the five-year-old. And this was why Neudeck believed death by drowning became such an important archetype in his life and a major motivation for his later relief efforts. Thanks to a flood of private donations, Neudeck was able to charter and outfit a decommissioned Dutch freighter, the Cap Anamor. And by the summer of 1982, that ship had rescued almost 10,000 boat people, most of whom were later allowed to seek refuge in the Federal Republic in West Germany. The group became best known at the time for this perilous undertaking, but its activities were not limited to saving the lives of those fleeing by sea. Neudeck also sent teams of German doctors and nurses to the Thai-Cambodian border to assist refugees who had just survived the Khmer Rouge genocide. Uh, here you see Neudeck hoisting up a, a sign at the site of this uh, refugee camp. And here he is aboard the Cap Anamor with some of the young uh, children he helped to, to save. Their work in the refugee camps relied on the generous support of private citizens and German celebrities, including the Nobel Prize winning 
novelist Heinrich Böll. Equally essential was the engagement of hundreds of West Germans who volunteered for stints of four to eight weeks. This included one nurse from Bonn who decided to volunteer instead of taking a ski vacation that year. She later explained that she'd worked for five weeks, quote, under the most primitive conditions, her words. To be effective, Neudeck believed that volunteers had to live together with the people without any showers or other niceties. Quote, experience and hardship and physically sharing their everyday reality is crucial for aid work. And one detects here, I think, the Christian impulse behind this former Jesuit novice's activities and perhaps a scholarly interest in existential philosophy as well. By way of contrast, I found in the archives, um, <clears throat> In the East German archives, uh, complaints by East German officials who had also sent doctors and other medical staff to, not to the border, but actually to Cambodia uh, itself. And the reason they were complaining was that the hotels that they were put in did not have any air conditioning. And that was, you know, I, did you, well, if, I, I don't want to call you on but there probably wasn't much air conditioning in East Germany. No, okay. <laughs> And it wasn't that hot. And it wasn't that hot. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, that's true. Okay. A, child, a childhood trauma, a Catholic upbringing, and a fortuitous visit to Paris in the winter of 1979. These were the three main influences that first spurred Rupert Nijdek into action. And when I sat with him decades later in a living room filled to the brim with foreign art and other artifacts he had collected from abroad over the years, the conversation eventually turned to why his volunteers did what they did. They had endless motivations, he suspected, but there was most certainly a very great collective willingness on the part of his fellow Germans to do, quote, more for humanitarian issues than all other European nationalities. And that most certainly has to do with the past. That's my deck speaking. But which past exactly? His own main motivation, he readily acknowledged, his, had been his traumatic experiences as a child refugee. But what about the suffering the Germans had caused and not the suffering that they had experienced themselves? Well, Nazi crimes against humanity, and in particular against the Jews, had played a, quote, powerful role, he believed. And he added that his organization's activities were a, quote, semi-conscious attempt to compensate somehow for this past, to portray Germany, quote, a little bit differently in the world. And when it came to humanitarian actions, he insisted, the German volunteers always did more than other Europeans because they didn't want to be surpassed in their efforts. This was, after all, one area where they were, quote, allowed to be on top of the world. Several weeks after meeting with Rupert Neudeck, I spoke with uh, Helmut Schmidt about his government's response to the Cambodian genocide. The former West German chancellor had come under attack in the late 1970s for not doing enough to help the refugees in Indochina. Well, what happened tens of thousands of miles away in Southeast Asia did not threaten West Germany in any way, he bluntly told me, and the genocide in Cambodia, quote, didn't concern us. Almost all Asian countries committed acts that, quote, violated morality, he added, but this was simply not our affair. And for those of you here who speak German, his uh, phrasing of that was quite interesting. He said, das war nicht unser Bier. It wasn't our beer. It wasn't our affair. There's some other very interesting anecdotes from that interview that if we have time, I'm glad to share during the Q&A. At any rate, he continued that telling me that the Federal Republic's vital interests came before moral and humanitarian considerations. In the realm of foreign affairs, those interests consisted at the time almost exclusively of the existential threat posed by Soviet nuclear weapons stationed in Eastern Europe. 
Foreign Minister Hans Dietrich Genscher, you see here on the right, he had a similar take at the time. Annoyed by repeated requests for information about the Cambodian genocide, he wanted to know why some West German politicians were placing, quote, so much value on this issue anyway. Well, whatever reservations the two men may have had, their country would take in almost 14,000 refugees from Indochina by the spring of 1980. Here's a photo of some of them uh, arriving at the airport in Frankfurt. That was the highest number among Western nations without any real special ties to the region, like the United States and France. By way of explanation, why they were willing to take in the, the, so many, and given the numbers, this was a drop in the bucket, but you know, still. By way of explanation, West German officials pointed to their own country's bitter experiences involving mass flight and expulsion. Like Rupert Neudeck and his family, some 12 million ethnic Germans fled or were expelled from Germany's eastern territories in the mid and late 1940s after they were taken from Germany and given to Poland and Czechoslovakia. Another 2.7 million fled communist East Germany between 1949 and 1961, the year the Berlin Wall was built. Genscher, so I'm in the last slide, uh, Genscher himself had fled the GDR as a young man, something he mentioned when speaking to foreign dignitaries about why they were willing to take in uh, these refugees. But as the number of refugees skyrocketed beginning in the late 1970s, and with it the number of people applying for asylum in the Federal Republic, the initial willingness to welcome these poor souls fleeing war-torn regions quickly gave way to angry resentment about foreign frauds supposedly taking advantage of German generosity. Two contrasting, contrasting sets of responses then to one of the world's most horrific genocides since the systematic murder of the European Jews in the 1940s. Copious concern and bountiful largesse on the one hand, apparent indifference and acrimonious backlash on the other. Responses that, of course, prefigure in many ways developments in today's federal republic. Since 2015, the xenophobic far right has enjoyed a political resurgence in the wake of Chancellor Angela Merkel's controversial decision to welcome more than a million refugees from Africa and the Middle East. Both developments drew global attention to Germany. But neither the chancellor's largesse nor the political backlash it brought in its wake should have been a surprise, at least not to those familiar with the story of what Germans have talked about and done in response to genocide and other mass suffering in foreign lands since 1945. Now, as I know you all know, there are few countries more haunted by the darker aspects of their recent history than Germany. 80 years after the end of World War II, the barbaric crimes committed by the Nazis continue to cast a long shadow at home and abroad, coloring perceptions and self-perceptions of the country and its people. Yet the story of how Germans managed to put their violent, genocidal past behind them in practice and create a stable and prosperous democracy, reluctant to use force and committed to the defense of human rights. That, I think, is an equally important and gripping tale. If the driving question about the years prior to 1945 has long been a disheartening one, where did Germany go wrong? The period since the war presents a different puzzle. How and why did Germany go right? I don't mean politically conservative? How did they go right? Well, my book never again tackles these questions in a roundabout way, using German responses to mass murder in other lands to understand how the weight of the past shaped beliefs and influenced actual behavior in the post-war present. And I consciously chose this indirect approach, German reactions to foreign genocide, because I hope to present a less stilted picture of German memory work. Now, 
There are many abstract theories about the nature and significance of collective memory, but to my mind, its true importance lies in its consequences, in its tangible effects on actual attitudes and actions. And that's why I focus in my book less on solemn statements by high-level officials, the usual approach to German Vergangenheitsbewältigung, uh, coming to terms with the past, and more on the concrete acts that came in response to reports of foreign genocide decades after the, the final solution. To get at these issues, and as, as Paul mentioned, I specifically look at German responses to the three infamous genocides that took place in Cambodia, Bosnia, and Rwanda from the mid-1970s to the mid-1990s. That choice is important, I think, because it lays bare evolving reactions to mass murder during a period of drastic change from the height of the Cold War, when two German states still existed, to the period following unification, from a time when few Germans showed much interest in the Holocaust, to one when few topics generated as much public attention as the genocide of the European Jews. The precise timing of these genocides is also significant. By chance, a conspicuous spike in interest about the fate of the European Jews coincided with the genocide in Cambodia. In fact, the Khmer Rouge were driven from power the very month the American miniseries Holocaust first aired on West German television in January 1979. That was a sensational media event. Has anybody seen this series, Holocaust? Maybe just a few. Just out of curiosity, what about Roots, which came out a year or two before that? Okay. Um, it was really a media sensation. Here is a, oh, Moriart, I forget. Anyway, on the cover of Der Spiegel, which is the most important uh, daily, uh, week weekly news magazine in Germany. That media event initiated a public fixation on the final solution at precisely the point in time when firsthand details about the carnage in Cambodia began to emerge. And it fundamentally influenced German responses to the crimes of the Khmer Rouge. In fact, it also affected how Germans spoke and thought about their own past. And that became especially clear during the infamous historians quarrel or Streit, a fierce public debate in the mid-1980s between German progressives and conservatives about the uniqueness and causes of what now increasingly became known as the Holocaust. Interestingly enough, this book here uh, was co-edited by uh, two Spiegel journalists. The one at the top, Ariana Bart, um, she wrote a two-part series that appeared in Spiegel where she looked at the fate of a single family. And it's, it's really quite striking. When, when you open up that issue, you see a family tree of 80 or 90 names, and about half of them are blacked out. Those are the people who died during this. I, I also interviewed her, and I asked her if she wrote that story about a family in response to you know the, all of the attention that was given to the Holocaust. And she said that she didn't, but who knows. There are other good reasons for beginning in the 1970s. This was the decade when global interest in human rights reemerged. It was also when the worldwide flow of refugees reached unprecedented proportions, a development that had a major impact on German responses to foreign genocide. It stimulated humanitarian efforts to relieve mass suffering abroad, but it also stoked fears about letting in too many foreigners, especially uh, bogus ones, supposedly coming to Germany for purely venal reasons. Few issues have enlightened, enlivened, not enlightened, have enlivened and politicized public debate of late as much as immigration. And of course, not just in the Federal Republic, as we Americans are well aware. 
My book draws attention to two contradictory impulses then since the 1970s, rampant fear, anger, and resentment about overburdening and what the Germans refer to as excessive foreignization, überfremdung, and a widespread desire, even a compulsion for some because of Germany's past to help the less fortunate. A look at German reactions to genocide during the first half of the 1990s takes our story into the period after the Cold War and thus into a much different geopolitical context. Germany's unexpected unification in 1990 not only marked the end of four decades of division, but also transformed the country's international position. The restoration of full sovereignty meant that the country now had greater freedom for maneuver as well as greater international responsibilities. And its responses to the twin genocides in Bosnia and Rwanda show how this dramatically reconfigured the country's foreign policy as well as its relationship with a now more distant past. The Federal Republic's change standing in the world gave rise to a great deal of anguish and hand-wringing at the time. Would unified Germany remain a quote-unquote tamed power or revert to its dangerous and destructive ways of yore? Had the country truly learned the lessons of its history? Well, the question of what those lessons even were became a great source of vexed debate in the shadow of genocidal atrocities in the Balkans, where unified Germany faced its most significant challenge abroad since unification, whether to participate in joint military efforts aimed at stopping genocide and other human rights abuses on foreign soil. Well, this confronted Germans with difficult choices that threw into disarray the old post-war consensus on foreign policy and the non-use of force. Even renowned pacifists like this man here, Joschka Fischer, a former student radical who was beating up West German policemen in Frankfurt in the early 1970s, who later became foreign minister, exchanged his leather jacket for an Armani suit, began to... to uh, run marathons. I have, by the way, if we have time, I have a very interesting anecdote about uh, Fisher that I'm happy to share with you, but only if we have time uh, during the Q&A. At any rate, even renowned pacifists like Fisher came down on the side of quote-unquote humanitarian intervention. As foreign minister in the late 1990s, he presided over Germany's first actual combat mission abroad since 1945 in Kosovo. And in support of that action, he, again, just as he did during the war in Bosnia, invoked the specter of genocide. You know what? I'm going to tell you the, I'm going to just tell you the, the anecdote. <laughs> so with all the name dropping I've done here, with all these people I've interviewed, um, I also wanted to interview Joschka Fischer. And I sent him at least a dozen emails, also to his secretary, someone who didn't read her email address. No response. No response. I'd say about 90% of the people I wrote responded positively, but not for sure. So for some reason, I used to spend a lot of time in Germany, but um, I hadn't been there since the summer of 2016. And I went for the first time again last June. So seven years. Friend picks me up at the airport. First thing we do is go to an ATM for me to get some money. I'm going into the you know, into the bank, and I notice somebody behind me, and I did something. Barth, no offense, but I did something most Berliners didn't do. I held the door for him, and was like, <laughs> well, guess who it was? Yoshka oh. Fischer. So I looked at him, my mouth dropped open. He, um, he knew I recognized him. He kind of looked down at the floor. I said, Herr Fischer, ich bin Andrew Port. I'm Andrew Port. He had no idea who I was. <laughs> so 
I told her, I said, you know, basically what I told you, you know, I, I wrote you a dozen times. I wrote to your secretary. You didn't respond. And he's, uh -huh. and finally I said, well, you know, I just published a book about German reactions to foreign genocide and you play a really prominent role in it. That was why I wanted to talk to him. I said, well, would it be okay if I sent you a copy of the book? And again, he hasn't said a word up to this point. <laughs> he looks at me and goes, uh, exactly. So he got his money. I got my money. He's walking out. There was a woman there at another ATM machine who said goodbye to her. And I went up to her. I was so excited. You know, Yoshiko. I was also angry by this response, mm -hmm. but I was also excited. And uh, I went up to her. I said, do you, do you know who that was? She said, of course I know who it was. And I told her the story and blah, blah, blah. And I said, you know, and I offered him a copy of my book and he didn't want it. And she said, well, if he doesn't want it, you can send it to me. <laughs> My initial interest in German responses to foreign genocide came in the summer of 1992, when I first heard reports that Serbs had set up concentration camps in Bosnia. And I know most of you are familiar with these difficult images. Uh, I was living in Germany at the time, and I vividly recall television images of emaciated men with shaved hair standing behind barbed wire. The images resonated for obvious reasons, and I distinctly recall thinking that this could not be true, that there could not be concentration camps in Europe in 1992. And I also recall a great deal of skepticism in Germany as well as policymakers, public figures in the media struggled to come up with a proper response. Never again Auschwitz or never again war. And those two slogans encapsulated the harrowing dilemma that many Germans faced after learning about the genocidal atrocities taking place in Bosnia. Should their country, because of its past, stand by and do nothing in response to reports of yet another genocide, this time only a day's drive from Berlin? Or should they participate in international interventions intended to stop mass slaughter by force. The story of how Germans confronted their past and the concrete responses that that had in response to mass atrocities abroad is a highly relevant story that I think is arguably as worthy of our interest as the darker topics in modern German history. Please don't misunderstand me. The focus on Nazism and the Holocaust is, of course, understandable. But the attention my book devotes to the admirable and often really uplifting actions of Germans from all walks of life, I think it offers countries with difficult pasts, including this one, including the United States, a masterclass in coming to terms with the more sinister aspects of their own history. This is true, especially at a time when many seem to fear that the United States might go the way Germany did in the early 1930s. Now, looking to Germans for inspiration, it reinforces a widespread tendency to see post-war Western Germany as a success story. Now, there are good reasons for questioning that simple but uplifting narrative, which downplays the less sanguine aspects of Germany's post-war past, racism, endemic racism, and sexism, environmental degradation, continuing wealth disparities, et cetera, et cetera. Still, even with those caveats in mind, and even when not measured against the horrible foil of Nazi Germany, the Federal Republic was indeed a success story, a place where Germans effectively put their violent, one's genocidal past behind them. Their responses to genocides in foreign lands are an untold aspect of that story. Now, it's true that those responses did not do much to prevent genocide. They were more uh, reactive than active, even when it was taking place in their own backyard in the Balkans. And despite their obligations as an early signatory of the 1948 UN Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of Genocide. Well, my book doesn't take a, a normative or, um, or, or prescriptive approach. It's not a, a jacuzzi of Germans for what they should have done in the face of genocide. 
I'm sure many of you here are familiar with uh, Samantha Power's book, um, A Problem from Hell. Right? That's what she does in there very clearly. Right? She, she uh, criticizes the United States for, for not taking action. Well, my book explores instead the parameters of the possible for post-war Germany, given the weight of its own past and its own international position before and after 1989. Hardly anyone, least of all the Germans themselves, would have wished or expected East or West Germany to take military action abroad. That would change dramatically after unification, and that transformation, along with the stormy domestic debates unleashed by the decision to intervene militarily in Bosnia, those are central themes of my book. And they remain important themes today, of course, especially since the Russian invasion of Ukraine in February 2022. Now, that's an important point, this one that no one expected Germans to take military action abroad. Why? Because I think it moves the conversation beyond moralistic condemnations of inaction, beyond the writing of history is what I like to call politics by other means. For most countries, grand actions involving military force are extremely difficult or simply not possible. And that's why I focus instead on what German officials and citizens could and did do short of sending combat troops, providing various forms of humanitarian assistance, for example welcoming large numbers of refugees to Germany. The Germans took in, uh, during the Bosnia conflict, the Germans took in twice as many refugees from Fort Mar Yugoslavia than all of the other European countries put together. So welcoming refugees, exerting diplomatic pressure uh, behind the scenes, enforcing economic sanctions, et cetera, et cetera. Reports of mass atrocities goaded Germans into action, in short. And what they did went far beyond high-sounding speeches meant to atone for past atrocities. And that's significant because I think it reveals a great deal about German values, mentalities, and lessons learned after 1945. Lessons that should be of interest to Americans searching for effective ways uh, to reckon with the more sordid aspects of their own country's past. What struck me repeatedly about German reactions to foreign genocide is that the legacy and lessons of the Third Reich and the Holocaust were not at all clear cut. That's why every time I've said lessons, I've you know, done scare quotes. The difficult choice between never again Auschwitz or never again war captures just how ambivalent the burden of history could be. In fact, as my book shows again and again, Germany's violent past could be and was used to draw diametrically opposed conclusions about the proper response to reports of foreign genocide. Those who tended to see Germany's hands tied because of its history, who spoke passionately of a quote, duty to nonviolence because of Nazi atrocities decades earlier, they met with equally heartfelt counterarguments by those who pointed to their country's past as an injunction to act. Quote, we have a political and moral duty to assist precisely in light of our history. Foreign Minister Klaus Kinkel told his colleagues in the diplomat in their State Department uh, that in June 1995, just two weeks before <coughs> the genocidal massacre at Trebinica. Quote, this is Kinkel again, it was, after all, the Allies who, using military force, by the way, freed us from the Nazi dictatorship. Well, if the Third Reich has taught us anything, it's perhaps that there are no easy answers to these questions and debates. But my book draws attention, I think, to something just as important. The mass suffering caused by Germans was not necessarily the past that mattered most. As Rupert Neudeck's story teaches us, the suffering that Germans experienced themselves, their often profound sense of victimhood, could be equally motivational, and so could perceptions of political and even economic self-interest. 
In fact, my book shows how these debates about proper responses to genocide were used over and over to score points against domestic political rivals, with progressives accusing conservatives of supporting uh, humanitarian military intervention in the hopes of one day uh, restoring Germany's status as a Großmacht or great power. Those on the right, conservatives responded in kind, asking, rightfully I think, why the left had remained so silent as Cambodian communists butchered millions. What those debates also show is that most conservatives in Germany confronted and took responsibility for Germany's past as seriously as their opponents on the left. That's an important and often overlooked legacy of the progressive political upheavals of the late 1960s, when Nazi crimes became, for almost all Germans, regardless of political outlook, the measure of all things evil. The willingness of conservative Germans to countenance their country's difficult past and draw important lessons from it distinguishes them, I think, from many of their counterparts, again, here in the United States, who seem disinclined to confront, much less take responsibility for the history and legacy of American racism. But it should also serve as a sign of encouragement, I think, that such efforts need not be exclusive, politically exclusive or one-sided, and neither should remorse. There's perhaps another important lesson here for an American audience, what to avoid when confronting the past. And this is going to be my final point today. After two decades of deafening silence about the Holocaust, the pendulum swung in the opposite direction, beginning in the late 1960s, really more in the late 1970s, uh, producing an almost obsessive public preoccupation with the dark side of Germany's past. And that eventually produced an angry backlash, even on the part of those who can in no way be considered apologists for the Third Reich. I refer here to Germans, even on the left, who complain that the political and moralistic use of negative memories about the Nazi past has been used as a high-handed, quote-unquote, moral cudgel against political enemies. Never Again shows how these very disputes dominate a discussion about genocide in foreign lands, fueling accusations that foreign atrocities were being used to relativize Germany's own earlier crimes. And this played out in the very way that language was used. Heated debates about the appropriateness of referring to Serb prison compounds in Bosnia as concentration camps. That was just one example of this. One that, of course, had eerie reverberations in recent debates in the United States about the use of that very charged term to describe holding facilities for immigrants on our southern border. The point is that Americans can indeed learn from the Germans about confronting their own checkered past. But those lessons are ambivalent. The need to achieve a balance between too little and too much, to, to strike a proper tone that doesn't give rise to nasty recriminations and indignant backlash, that I think is perhaps the most important lesson the Germans can offer us.